Explorer. I'm your producer, Todd Bartu, and this is the Offshore Explorer. Offshore Explorer looks at the world from the sailor's point of view, port by port. Together, we share stories that detail the important intersections between sailing culture and life, past, present, and future. Let me introduce our host, a lifelong sailor who has traveled the world from mug yachts to tugboats to ice boats, and a published author who has written for both stage and screen, Captain Scott Todson. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, we're doing pretty well today. Uh, we have a sunny day, 71 degrees, uh, which is not uh, uncommon for a Southern California time. Sailing is excellent. We got about a 6 to 10 mile an hour wind, and uh, the seas are... You know, pretty calm. I understand it's going to rain tomorrow. Yeah, we got a chance of rain, uh, but nothing nothing too serious. So uh, this is the time of year in which uh, we begin. It's not here yet, but it will be. We start to get what they call the Pineapple Express, which is uh, Southern California gets inundated with rain um, from the Hawaiian Islands in that area of the Pacific, and it runs up. Goes over California as rain, and then it ends up in the mountains of Utah and Colorado and stuff as snow. That's where they get their spring skiing, so that's always a good thing. And um, it will be pretty windy here, but it'll be a nice, soft, tropical wind. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, you know, love the weather here, uh, and. I understand that, you know, we have some new additions to the Offshore Ships Locker, uh, which is our uh, web store that we have for items that are personally curated for your sailing needs. It's offshoreshipslocker.com. Can you tell us about the the some of the new items that we have in store for this week? Yeah, I uh, we have this wonderful relationship with Seiko watches. Now I know a lot of people are kind of like not wearing watches anymore because you've got your cell phone in one hand and and your computer in your other hand and your and your iPad in another hand and if you have three hands you can know what time it is and anywhere in the world. Um, but, uh, if you're sailing and you go out in the water, trust me, when you get just a little ways off the coast, about 20 miles, mostly sometimes less, um, you're going to lose any kind of internet or anything like that. So you'd be pretty screwed as far as that's concerned. So it's good to have a watch that way, um, you have at least one element of the, um, uh, ability to navigate and that's knowing what time it is um so yeah if you want to go check it out go to offshoreshipslocker.com and uh another bit of business is i hold in my hands another five-star review from one of our listeners Woo-hoo! Uh, th- <laughs> this is a uh five-star review from our friend nancy um she said uh Surprised and enjoyed by the podcast. I tuned into the podcast on the Eastern Med since these are my present home waters. Scott is a wonderful storyteller and wove sailing along with some doses of politics, sociology, and history. Looking forward to hearing some of his other podcasts and stories within. I hope he will come back to Israel someday so we can show him another side. Thank you very much, Nancy, for your kind words. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Nancy. And and to make a note of that, I, I have um, been in other parts of Israel um, at different times and have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed myself. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want us to read your five-star review on the air, just go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes and leave us a five-star review, and maybe you'll hear us on the show. So without further ado, now that all the business is out of the way, what do we have in store for today's episode? Today we talk about wind. Wind, wind, wind. Specifically the catabatic wind. Um, and I'll let, the, I'll let the podcast do the explanation. Great. Take it away, Scott. Wind is 
everywhere and nowhere. Wind is the circulatory system of the earth, its nervous system too. Energy and information flow through it. It brings warmth and water, enriches and strips away the soil, aerates the globe. Wind shapes the lives of animals and humans among them. Trade follows the path of the wind. Wind made the difference in wars between Greeks and Persians, the Mongols and the Japanese. Wind helped destroy the Spanish Armada, and wind is no less determining in our inner lives. The Fawn, Mistral, Scirocco, Santa Ana, and other ill winds of the world are correlated with disease, suicide, and even murder. Gale force warnings kept us inside the breakwater of Mandraki Harbor, Rhodes, Greece. Known as the Kregel wind, it blew from the northeast with a strong pressing cold that declared the hot summer Meltemi dead for this year. The swell rolled along the industrial porkway like a snake slithering up and down, crashing into the jetty with a thudding slap of indignity. Mid-October finds the Greeks closing up the summer stores and the markets and the streets that were once lined with tourists smelling of suntan lotion and looking for special bargains were gone. I had wrapped up my Eastern Med charter a couple of weeks later than normal. My summer was spent sailing over 2,000 nautical miles, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Cyprus, and back to my base in Rhodes. Now, I had to return to the Caribbean, another roughly 6,000 nautical miles, or about 30 or 40 days of straight sailing. I couldn't go because I had a lot of repairs, so it was a little slow. And I'll mention this because uh, Eastern Med Part 1 and Part 2 described the situation and what we had gone through in the adventure of sailing all the distance in Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Cyprus, and back. But I also mentioned in my last story my French mate with the beautiful free spirit and antithesis to wearing clothing on the boat. Her name was Laura. Trade winds. The eastern flow of warm winds north and south of the equator. I walked along the sandy ground beach in St. Martin on the French side. The beach was on the leeward side of the island and there was little or no breeze. Puffy trade wind clouds glided by as if on a conveyor belt in a pastry factory. Never a hint of shadow from a single one. The trade winds themselves were confined to the Dutch side, leaving the leeward beach hot and somewhat oppressive. It was my birthday, and the trade winds served as an approximate metaphor of the march on time. I was a follower of the trade winds, then the westerlies into the med, with all points on the compass rose, with the name of the wind on the back, and again into the trades. My life, my boat followed the same path as the explorers and the empires that followed. My business was the charter business. Memorable vacations sailing around the Med and the Caribbean. I did my best to avoid hurricane season. I had experienced two damaging Cat 5 hurricanes and decided I would rather make a crossing to Europe. Better part of common sense, valor, and economy. For my birthday, I planned to walk on the beach, have dinner in town, a nightcap at a local bar. Chances were good I would run into somebody I knew. I would casually mention my birthday and they would buy me drinks and I would drink and I would find my way back to the boat, which was at anchor in the lagoon. I'd sleep off the hangover, and I'd get up and get on with my living. 
the getting on part was I needed to find another chef slash mate for the boat. My last crew scattered to the wind. Nothing personal. Just time to go back to the real world and start living, they said. I had a crew agency looking for me, but I always seemed to be lucky in finding the right people when I needed them. Finding Laura, and should I say Laura finding me, was an immense stroke of luck. I'm not really a beach person per se. I like the beach. I've been going to the beach all my life, um, but I, I love diving off the boat into the deep, cool water and swimming. I don't like the sand in my britches. Uh, I just I don't care. Um, and I always see the beaches, like any other sailor would, as, as being trouble. Um, you know, a place to crash the boat, to sink the boat. Still, it was a good place to walk and, and scrape the tough skin off the heels of my feet. Walking on teak decks um, all the time can engender some tough souls. By this time in my life, I'd had enough experience with the other sex to not get my hopes up romantically. I had hoped I had evolved where my projection and desires toward a woman could be tamed, could be cool, could be, you know, um, committed but uncommitted, um, patient but impatient, um, interested but not interested. And I was evolving into a man who saw the person inside the persona of femininity. I knew how to be kind and deferential and respectful. I grew up in a household with two sisters, a strong mother, and an even stronger grandmother. And they sculpted my understanding and respect for women. If I was accused, as one is in dissolving relationships, of being noncommittal, I would pl plead guilty as charged. I wasn't ready to settle down. I, I wanted to travel and sail to foreign lands. I wanted to be that guy with the rich experience and history. For those anxious for me to get to the point about the wind and understanding everything I'm saying here, what I'm doing is setting up an extended metaphor about the wind in a sailor's life. This is the last description. The last description is metaphorically related to describing the Earth's overall wind pattern. Polar ice caps have a dense cold air and the trade winds a light warm air. The cold warm, cold to warm, cold easterlies closer to the poles, westerlies closer to the equator. I was the polar air to her relationship. And Laura was the equatorial trades. We had a lot of movement. Everything about sailing is about relationships. Weird sentence, but true nonetheless. A sailor's relationship with the wind is the primary focus of his life and success. It is possible that a cautious sailor may never experience more than a strong squall in his lifetime of sailing. A good skipper can choose when to go out when it's within his or her margin of safety. Sometimes, depending on where you live and sail, the wind associated with it can't be avoided. This is why sailors spend a preponderance of time watching and studying the weather. What they're really studying is the wind. The wind is created by a difference in pressures and pressures are created by temperature of the air any given at any given spot watching the america's cup for example the commentators talk about one side of the course of the other having a deeper pressure thus more wind more wind faster sailing they have very sophisticated devices to measure the air pressure direction and rate of flow even with all this technology and crunching of numbers Knowing the unseen 
is still a guess at best. Relationships are the same. So you know where I'm going here. Here is my basic theory of relationships. What I want in a relationship takes work and attention. How I work at a relationship is a struggle between being comfortable and being uncomfortable in my own behavior. If you're lazy, your sheets will definitely luff. Sailing like relationships take constant attention. I wasn't interested in some kind of agreement where my partner and I found an unspoken detente resulting in comfort or, or an autopilot relationship, if you will. I was searching for something more, and more is what I got. Her eyes were black velvet. They reflected her surroundings like a rolling diorama, sparking, sparking, shining. She was shyly intellectual. Ideas operated on several tracks at once, yet her inherent ease of concentration was always bright, direct, inquisitive. When her focus fell on you, oh my, you felt the nervous caution that comes when only the precise truth about yourself is required. It's hard for a rogue character who is curated, a personality of the captain in the charter biz to climb out of that blind and be honest with yourself. Self-awareness, awkward boyish embarrassment, a plethora of unused adjectives foreign to this kind of description, but more likely to be used in a profound religious exaltation. That's what she did to you. That's what she did to me. The fear of losing her gaze for a moment because the light and the warmth was so intense and safe, you didn't want to be the cause of her moving on. My suppressed desire, I was sexually attracted to her, so much so I couldn't breathe. The micro low pressures created by my desire could have easily propelled a yacht a great distance. There she stood on the beach. She wore a loose-fitting embroidered cotton shirt. The cotton was thin enough you could see the dark areola around her nipples dance with the embroidered tropical flowers. Her hair was tied up on the top of her head and corralled with a brightly colored tropical scarf. She wore pink bikini bottoms. She carried clogs, shoes from a different place in the world, not really beach shoes. She was athletic. She glided up to me and offered her hand. It was a signal that we would need to know each other a little better before their ritual French kissing of cheeks. She was expecting me in the strangest way. In fact, many months later, she told me she had a dream that she would meet her lover on a beach. She was waiting when I arrived. She was my Helen of Troy, the launcher of a thousand Greek ships. We were introduced by a mutual friend, Pedro, who came bounding down the beach, excoriating us to come quickly and see the fish. Pedro and his, his group of friends, including Laura, had traveled from France together. They shared a house for the winter in St. Martin. They were French nomads. And if any of you have been around the world and have any kind of experience, you'll, you'll find these groups of nomads. They may be selling timeshares or working in restaurants in some sort of exotic port, but they're, they're, it's a very definite plan. They would work a little back home, save up, by living communally, then travel to exotic destinations, mostly French islands or departments for a few months, then they would repeat. This collective discovery is foreign to most countries, especially Americans, um, who don't do well in communal situations. 
I was introduced to Laura by Pedro, who wished out loud to go snorkeling. Others of the nomad tribe joined us, standing a, on a dried, exposed coral reef. Just, just a little bump in the sand, really. Plans were hatched about finding a mask and flippers on the cheap because they had no money. Um, everything was done. Like, can we borrow this? Can we do this? Can we do that? But all I could see was Laura. I had come to the conclusion that whatever Laura wanted, I wanted to. I offered they could come on my boat and I would take them snorkeling. I would make a day of it. I pointed across the bay to my boat at anchor inside the lagoon. I was everyone's new hero, but more importantly, I was Laura's new hero. I offered a job to Laura to be my chef and my maid. I had a series of charters lined up in the British Virgin Islands, and I needed the help. At first, she agreed for two reasons. One, she was a bit bored being with Pedro and the group of nomads. Two, the money was very attractive. Our relationship started out with a very strong interest. And she, uh, I think, was a bit more cautious. You know, I was presenting her with a lifestyle that appealed to her nomad experience, um, but required a series of skills that she really hadn't developed. For example, living 24-7 with me. Cooking. Cleaning to a different kind of standard than normal cleaning. Getting used to having guests on the boat, sharing her space, a small space. But most important aspect of the whole thing is she had to trust me. And I had to trust her because I was teaching her how to sail the boat without me. Primary thing, if you go back to some of my podcasts, I always talk about um, train everybody on your boat captain you don't need to drive the boat all the time you don't need to dock the boat all the time teach your trusted mate wife concubine mistress kids teach them to drive the boat teach them to dock the boat it's very important for safety so we left St. Martin to the excited farewells from the nomads for the BVI. Laura had confided the secret that she believed we would be together forever. I was stunned by this. The Westerlies, known as the horse trades, the wind from the trades, trade winds, flow north and south from the equator in a circle, then west towards Europe in the northern hemisphere, and south again toward Africa in the southern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere. So you have a circular motion at the top of the equator, and you have a circular motion at the bottom top part of it, the northern part of it, is called the westerlies, the horse trades, because this is where the Spanish galleons sailed back on. This was also a very interesting um, idea because when Columbus was standing on the coast of Spain, he understood the circulation, even though he misjudged the size of the earth when he got to the caribbean he had one two choices really he could go north to get home or he could go south to get home he chose to get north go north if he had chosen to go south we would have never known columbus because he would have gotten lost in south america brazil and and not put two and two together to cross the atlantic back the other way so the westerlies are your workman like winds they're generated um, between the warm air of the equator and the cold polar air. Our voyage, St. Martin to St. Thomas, is a downwind voyage about 70 nautical miles. 
Laura was feeling a little seasick. I laid in, she laid in the cockpit, curled up in the corner, and slept almost the entire time. Part of the reality of sailing is not every crew member is going to feel 100% all the time. I gave her some ginger snap cookies to munch on. Ginger helps with the symptoms of seasickness. But only the frequency and repetition works for real. The more you're on the boat, the less seasick you're going to get. You get used to it. And by the way, being seasick is, is absolutely normal. Not being seasick is the abnormal part when you're on a boat. She regained her equilibrium when we reached the entrance to Charlotte Amale in St. Thomas. I think it was the shift in the boat motion. It seemed more appealing to her inner ear and her stomach. And it appeared after months that the only point of sail that seemed to bring her seasickness on was the downward wind. Running a charter boat is an exhausting business, and I'm referring to week-long charters. Lots of food to buy, menus to plan, drinks to store, fuel, water, washing the boat, laundry, which is the greatest pain in the ass, cleaning heads, constant staterooms, always cleaning, making them right, fixing whatever little thing breaks. And after all that work, you have to greet your guests with a fresh and enthusiastic smile. And they are a little apprehensive, of course, because they just don't know what kind of person you are, what your habits are, or whatever. Your political beliefs are, which we try to stay away from on the boat. And another rule is, which I told Laura at the time, I said, we never criticize our guests while they're on their boat. Because the moment that comes out of your mouth, it, it will be revealed in your behavior and your guests will pick it up. Everybody's too close to to say something bad about the other person. So it's better to say nothing. Now up to this point, Laura and I had just shared deep knowing looks. We held hands. She occasionally, without request or prompting, put her arm on my shoulder. She liked to take her finger and curl it around my ponytail. The guests all assumed we were a couple, and we believed it as well. When we were on our first charter, uh, we had to to share the forepeak um, to sleep because we had um, six guests. So while we were making the bed in the forepeak, this is the... The last thing we were doing, the guests were about, we're going to arrive in an hour, two hours or something like this. So we were, I was helping her make the bed in the forepeak, which is, as you all know, can be fairly tight. Making that bed in the forepeak was a kind of declaration to, to make love that night but we'd have to do it very quietly because the guests were very thin wall away. She said this in this um, beautiful way. She said in her beautiful French lilt in a kind of as a matter of fact statement, like, could you pass me the sugar? Um, she said, we, shall, we will have to make love tonight, but be very quiet. And, and the, saying that kind of made us both laugh because it seems so matter of fact and dispassionate. But what happened is, is we ended up making love right then and there on the unmade bed. And we, and it was hot and there was no wind and there was no breeze coming through the hatch. And, and, and we, it was just, it was a lot of pent up desire and, you know, looking forward and we we're going to town. And then suddenly there was a knock on the side of the boat and we had to scramble to put our clothes on and we rushed f and flushed and sweating to greet the guests. And for the next three months, we made love every chance we could. If the guests all went swimming, we made love. At night, we would take them 
to go dancing, we would run into the bushes and make love. We were very happy. We made a commitment to each other. We returned to St. Martin after the charters in the BVI, where she was going to fly home. She had a ticket with her nomad friends, settle some affairs at home to see her mother. Then she would rejoin me in Italy for the summer charter season in Greece and Turkey. I left St. Martin in April to cross the Atlantic. She flew home across the Atlantic. rows of winds. Zephyrus is the west wind and bringer of light spring and early summer breezes. One of the neat weather transitions while sailing from the Caribbean to the Med is a shift from summer-like weather in the trade winds to spring-like conditions of Zephyrus light spring, early summer breezes. The boat had a different feel without Laura on board. This was our first test, so to speak, being apart for roughly a month. There was a light and a warmth, now paler. The light of promise and only little sort of veins of warmth that came across the ocean as as the earth changed from spring to summer. Boris, the north wind. By the time I reached the Azores, a steady, cold north wind had set. I was sailing fast on a beam reach. I pushed the crew and the boat for greater speed. I was trying to picture what Laura was doing. I was confident she would meet me. I would pick up where we left off in the trades. But I didn't, I didn't want to doubt. I didn't want doubt to seep into my thinking. But that is the way of the north wind, this doubt. Eurus, the east wind. Eurus was the child of Eos and Erostras. He is the Greek god of the east wind and brother to Zephyrus, Boris, and Notus. Like his siblings, Eurus was a winged god, the strong wind that brought warmth and rain from the east. It's very Greek-centric but applicable to all around the world. I was 100 miles from the Straits of Gibraltar when I was forced to motor. I was driving directly into the teeth of a Force 10 gale of eastern wind. My desire to reach Italy was now buffeted by wind and wave. The boat would dip down, the bowsprit would dig and toss tons of water over the bow. In the cockpit at the helm, I stood with boots, bib, jacket, snorkel mask. The sun was super bright. The salt was burning my face. The cockpit itself was filled with a foot of water because it couldn't drain fast enough. The gunnels were gushing like fire hoses. And this constant pushing, pushing to get to Laura, pushing to get to Gibraltar, pushing past and through the east wind. 
after about eight hours of this, we finally turned the corner. We were in the med. We had arrived at Gibraltar. And I called Laura. She and a couple of her nomad friends, girlfriends actually, from art school at the Sorbonne University. This was new information to me. I, I, I knew she was smart. I didn't really kind of get into what her education was or if she'd gone to university, but she had, she had actually graduated from the Sorbonne and she was uh, very, very talented. And I knew kind of at that moment that I needed to learn more about her. It just wasn't all about sex. We needed to, to really develop our relationship and, and I needed to delve deeper into it and she needed to delve deeper into my background. And I think we, I realized maybe for the first time I spent far much, far too much time talking about myself and not listening to her. And I had seriously blundered. She was gracious enough not to say anything, but I realized, I realized at that moment that um, I had made a mistake. Notice the south or southwest wind. Notice is the god of the south or southwest wind, which is very warm and moist air, and it brings with it fog and rain. Being the wind of fog and mists, notice was dangerous to shepherds on the mountaintops or to mariners at sea, for he hindered visibility. For this same reason, the south wind was uh, a friend of thieves, enabling them to do their dastardly work unseen. Leaving Gibraltar another six days, I would be in Palermo. I had talked to Laura on the phone. There was something in her voice that should have told me something had changed. She would meet me there in 10 days as she wanted to visit Saint-Tropez first. Crossing the Med from Gibraltar to Sicily is about a thousand nautical miles. I had been driving myself and the boat relentlessly for a month. Now, to get back in her arms, I had to wait. She wanted to visit a town she could visit at any time. She wanted, she, she, she could do a day trip from her home. I, I, this disturbed me. I, and it's, I'm wrong to be disturbed, but it disturbed me. The spring offers inconsistent weather patterns. Notice spread, dense fog, low ceilings, flat seas, and very light winds. I was very concerned about the traffic in the med. There's a lot of traffic in the med, a lot of ships moving very quickly. And in fact, it turned out that my biggest worry was actually a submarine that kept popping up from time to time along my route. Um, to this day, I believe that they were using us for firing exercises. Um, I saw them right out off of Gibraltar and Spain, the coast of Spain, Saw them again about halfway, and then I saw them um, as we approached uh, Sicily itself. A couple of nights, the fog was so dense, um, I couldn't see the bow. I flew my 150, which is a big sail, big light sail, which managed to stay full most of the time. Uh, when it luffed, it would snap the moisture all over the cockpit like rain. That's how wet this fog was the main and the mizzen remained up my stalwarts uh with a light breeze on the beam as well as the staysail so i had everything i could i could put up put up and i kept the motor running slightly above idle we turned just under a thousand rpms it's, it was a good pull for the engine for the for the motor itself it was a lehman six-cylinder diesel 120 horsepower um, and I could motor for most of the trip, but I needed wind for at least, you know, two days to make it comfortable. Normally, it would not be a problem. Um, normally, I would run 
my motor for about three hours a day on long trips. This would be enough to charge up the, um, the batteries if needed to be. I had a generator also that I could use. Um, and surprisingly enough, the generator used more um, fuel than the, than the motor. Um, so I could charge up all the batteries off of the alternator on the motor. And that would cover the battery bank um, because I was using an auto helm and the electricity, the 12 volts it was using for that could be easily replenished. And I'd never, I really never had a problem with my auto helm running electricity wise. Just had a lot of batteries, that's all. And I, this whole thing, because of the inconsistency of the wind, I mean, there was hardly any wind at all. I was not going to lose any time and distance. So while I'm doing this, uh, I'm thinking, um, you know, like I'm thinking how much fuel can I use? How fast can I go? I, can I push the RPMs just a little bit higher? Um, you know, the sails, where's the wind coming from? And it was all south, southeast winds. So, you know, it's basically on my beam. Now I measure... Um, miles per gallon per hour i don't measure like miles per hour for your car i measure per per gallon because you you never know what your sea state's going to be and if, for example coming through the straits of gibraltar in a force 10 gale um i was at 1800 almost 2000 2000 rpms and I was making four and a half, five knots into the wind, into the waves, into the current, which was pretty good given the conditions, but I was using over, over two gallons an hour at that. And I couldn't afford to do that because I had 300 gallons on board, which gave me a range of about 150 hours at 1,000 RPMs. On average, that was about seven knots. And I could safely motor, well, not safely, but, you know, pretty close to a 1,000 miles, nautical miles. The reality was really more comfortable to think about, like, 900 nautical miles. So these maddening calculations continuously went through my mind. And under the cloak of the fog, I was disturbed. I was worried. I was forlorn and really immature. <laughs> it's true. The woman I had so openly given my heart to, who seemed to touch all those buttons, both intellectually and physically, had shaken my confidence with a slightly sideways tone of voice on a telephone call from a phone booth in France to Gibraltar. Crazy. But I was like a live wire. <laughs> The fog cleared. Nostro gave way to his brother, Boras, and the summer was setting up to be a warm and gentle one. According to the almanac, this summer would be uh, more warm than usual, with less noise from the Meltemi. As I spoke in my podcast about Palermo, episode 11, and it's called Protocol, my Sicilian friends were very happy to see me again. This is something I touched base for 18 years in a row. And I waited for Laura to arrive. I cleaned the boat. I was just in a crazy position. When she stepped off the train, she was carrying her backpack. And I saw a different person. She was still warm and gentle as before, but she seemed more assertive and angrier than before she left. Her friends were artists and we formed a little band of creatives. And much like periodic winds, these winds change their direction periodically as there is a change in the seasons. You have monsoon winds. The temperature difference created by the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Himalaya wall, Himalayan wall forms 
the basis of the monsoon in the Indian subcontinent. Land breeze. These winds blow from the land to the sea, carrying no moisture, but dry and warm air. Your Temi is a little like that. And of course your sea breeze, where the winds blow from the sea to the land, carrying some moisture. And last but not least is the mountain or valley breeze. Valley breeze is the hot air blowing from the valley which flows up the slopes of the mountain. And in contrast, the mountain breeze is the valley breeze that is cold air from the mountain flowing down towards the valley. This was where the relationship was going. This is what it was like with these different friends on the boat, these girls. They, there was a different kind of flow of air and personality and a people. So we sailed across the Ionian to Greece, and we dropped the girls off in Eos. They would continue to uh, party for the remainder of the summer, going wherever the wind took them. And I think Laura was on the fence about this style of life. I think there was something in her that that was ready to get serious. You know, have a baby. Uh, find the right situation to pursue her art. She spoke of Paris. Um, she was, uh, she, she still enjoyed, you know, lovemaking with me. And, and, you know, we had such a great time. We even seemed to laugh harder than before. I had offered, really, in so many different ways to change my life for her. And I was ready to get back to writing full-time. I had some movies I wanted to make, um, but she didn't believe me. She believed me to be this captain. A captain she loved, but to take him out of his element would be wrong. I told her she was being deferential. Didn't, don't worry about that. I offered a plan which I think she tacitly agreed to at the beginning of the summer. And after our big summer charter, she would go to Paris and I would cross back to the Caribbean and she would join me in Antigua and we would do one more season. We would sell the boat. We would move to Paris. Um, in the one more season with the sale of the boat, we would get enough money to, to get off to a comfortable start in Paris. So in episode 47 and 48, I described the adventure, but what I didn't say was the jeopardy of my decision had put me, the boat, and Laura at risk, and it didn't sit well with Laura at all, even though she, she didn't say anything about it. But it, that decision where I decided to help those refugees and save a family's life, I had failed to see one of the consequences of that. And it was the concept of risk, of risking everything that Laura couldn't stomach. She respected the decision. She supported the decision at the time, but something in her was far more risk adverse than I had ever imagined. Sailing back to Rhodes from Cyprus, we were both very tired. It happens after you have a charter. I don't care if it's a couple of months or a couple of weeks or a couple of days. When the guests leave, there's an exhale that happens and you're just exhausted. We had everything set. There were a series of very high cliffs along the Tur Turkish coast. They're called the Seven Sisters. They're known for having a unique wind event. The title of our show today, A Catabatic Wind. Bora, Fyung, Chinook, these are descending wind names. However, they're not a true catabatic wind because they start with rainfall on one side of the mountain, then they rise up and over the mountain and descend down in a natural flow. 
Catabatic winds are cold, dense air on top of a mountain that falls or drains down the mountainside across the water, gaining speed until the force can reach gale force. It is sudden and sometimes brief, but the damage it can do is astounding because you can't actually prepare for the wind, but you can be aware. It was the middle of the dog watch. I had the main, mizzen, staysail, and jib set tight as we were beating against a 10 to 15 knot breeze with occasional shifts from warm offshore, uh, warm, uh, offshore breeze. Laura and I were laying together on the windward side of the, in the corner of the cockpit together uh, with a blanket over us to stay warm. I mean, folks, even sail, sailing at night in the Caribbean can be in a sense, kind of chilly, so, um, and you've got to keep your eyes on things. I had the auto helm on, which I always have on, and she was asleep with her head on my chest. From my position, I could see the sails, the traffic, the radar screen, which was just inside the cockpit, uh, but visible, had the proximity alarm set. We were a mile and a half from the seven sisters to our starboard. In fact, I remember that I think they were just just abaft of our stern. Laura woke up and cupped my chin in a kind of urgency. She said, I can't marry you. I am leaving, and I don't want you to follow me to Paris. I think I might have uttered, what? Feeling the absolute crushing fall of my heart into my stomach. If it wasn't for the roar of a jet engine coming towards us, I said, hang on. The catabatic wind hit us at 105 miles an hour. The boat was knocked down. The mainsail laid in the sea. Laura slid against the helm and hung on for dear life. The gust abated slightly, and she began to right herself. I scrambled to release the sheet and the main. The auto helm was completely freaked out. I yelled above the roar to turn off the auto helm. Laura did. She was cool-headed. Gosh. She grabbed the cushions that slid against the safety lines because they're expensive. We didn't want to lose those. And we finally write it. And I managed to turn the boat downwind. And it was still blowing like 50 knots. The downwind direction allowed me to get the mizzen down, which was shredded. And now I worked my way forward. I reset the mainsail, adjusted the boom vent so as to spill as much air as possible. I moved to the foredeck. The staysail was also shredded. I pulled it down onto the deck. It It looked like as if a clothesline had broken. The laundry laid helter-skelter on the deck, and the jib was ripped, but not too bad. I took it down and secured it to the safety lines with ties. Laura was at the helm. She was guiding the boat downwind. I signaled to adjust her course a little further north. We were literally at the very edge of the catabatic wind. Another five miles, and we were back to normal. Laura said nothing. She went downstairs. She straightened out the cabins. She made us coffee. And we sat together at the top sp- on the top step of the companionway. Tears in both our eyes. Our hearts ripped and torn like all the sails of my boat. I last saw Laura get into a cab in Rhodes, Greece. She was on her way to the airport. In a strange way, we we both knew we were right and wrong at the same time. 
I would need to change. She would need to change. But she felt she couldn't do it with me because she knew I wasn't finished with this chapter of my life. She said two things before climbing into the cab. You are really in your element sailing. And I've learned how to love. And I hope you've learned how to be loved. She got in, shut the door. The cab drove off. And I saw her take one more look back at me through the rear window. And I never saw her again. Thanks for sharing, Scott. That was a great story. I'm sorry that things didn't turn out better, but I'm sure you probably learned a lot from that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I as I said I, in the piece, is I learned how to how to love and how to be loved. Um, and even though uh, that wasn't our time, um, it uh, it was a good experience. It was a good growing experience, and um, it's benefited me today. And I have a an absolutely lovely partner, and um, I can't. There's just, you know, I I couldn't have such a lovely partner if I didn't know. So, what do we have planned for next week's episode? Uh, uh, next week, uh, we're going to do something a little closer to home. We're going to do a piece on L.A. Harbor. Thank you for tuning in. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, be sure to rate and review. You can find us on Facebook and at offshoreexplorer.org. You can also listen to past episodes at offshore-explorer.simplecast.com. Our theme song is sung by Paulette McWilliams with additional music by Amanu Itomi and Tommy Twain. Until next time, fair winds and calm seas. <laughs>